We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ child was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler, who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. The herald called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star had, they had seen in the east went ahead of them until they stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another, do you say route or route? Okay, that either, right? Either or either, right? <laughs> well, they went, uh, they returned to their country by another route. Now, Sarah, what would we say in Ghana? Route. We'll say route. Okay. Path. 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 <laughs> Don't throw me off my right here. <laughs> This Sunday is, can you hear me? This Sunday is what you call the Epiphany Sunday. And it's so, so important in the, in the Christian calendar. Actually, it begins the Christian calendar. We start from Epiphany and then we end at Christmas. And in some of the Orthodox churches, this Sunday, they don't celebrate Christmas, but this Sunday is rather the Christmas. This is, this is like the big kahuna, you know, how many days after like the big show for the Greek Orthodox, the you know the the um, the other churches, you know they they, they hold the Epiphany Sunday because that is where the um, the so-called Magi went to see Jesus and it was revealed to them that this is the Christ Child. Now Epiphany is it, 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 a great word, and I don't know whether you yourself go through Epiphanies. Epiphany means a revelation. Something is revealed to you. Epiphany sometimes happens to you like the light bulb goes on. You know, the, you hear the expression like a light bulb went on for me. Something happened and you, you caught it. You know what I mean? It's like you were in a dark place. You were trying to make a decision. And all of a sudden, there's a prompting. There is a clue. There is a nod. There is a tag. There is something that happens and that makes you to be sure of the decision you are about to make. That's an epiphany. Sometimes an epiphany is about a revelation. It's about something you're thinking about, a decision you have to make. And sometimes an epiphany is a reaffirmation of something that you're already processing, you're already thinking about, but then when the epiphany happens, because of the action that you do, it reinforces or reaffirms the epiphany, reaffirms the revelation. Are you, are you getting what I'm saying? You know, it's like, oh, if you wanted to do something, you know, I mean, boom, God gives you a clue. You know, God brings, gives us different clues and signposts in our lives. You know, sometimes you want to make a decision that is not clear, and all of a sudden, events line up, and you just know, bam, this is the decision I gotta make. Even as a pastor, I have epiphanies all the time. Sometimes, believe it or not, I struggle with the sermons. I struggle with the scriptures. Sometimes you read the scriptures and you think, how can I get a message out of the scripture? How can I 
What am I going to, what's this message about? What's the theme? What's the topic? What is this scripture conveying to the people? How can I take the text and, and assimilate the text and, and, and analyze the text and think about it and pray about it and be able to get a sermon out of the text? And so sometimes you wrestle with the sermons and you think, do I want to preach this? Do I want to teach on this? Do I want... Then, you know, you go on a visitation or you go and you are talking with somebody out of the ordinary, maybe having lunch with someone. And all the storylines, everything that you may be saying, or what their issues are, will point you in the right direction. You tell them, oh, this is what the story is about. This is how I can craft the sermon. This is what, you know, by God's grace, I can present to the people. It's an epiphany. It's, it's a revelation. And epiphanies can change your life. It can alter the course of history. It can alter your, your path from going in the wrong direction to the right direction when that light bulb goes on. You know, there's some people who, it's like they never grow up or they never take a step. They never reach their potential until that bulb goes on, until they receive that epiphany. <laughs> Epiphanies have changed the course of history. Let me give you one example. How many know about Paul, the disciple? You know Paul? Saul who became Paul. Now Paul was the one who went on a missionary journey to Europe, you understand? And when he started his missionary journey, he was going eastward. He was going to be going to Russia. And then there was a cry in a place called Macedonia. And the people said, come over here to Macedonia and help us. You know, come here, we have a need, we have a need. And he was like wrestling with where he wants to go, different places he wants to go. But when the call came for him to come over to Macedonia, he changed, he went, instead of going eastward, he went westward. He ended up in Europe, to Athens and to Spain and, and brought the gospel on the doorsteps of Europe. And eventually, the gospel brought to America, you understand? Imagine if he went eastward. If somebody hadn't called him and said, hey, you know, come over here to Europe and help us. And he went to Russia. Well, the Russians, maybe they're not going to be communists now. You know what I mean? They, they were, you know, the Russians, they were uh, uh, struggling with the word of God. There was a time under the communist uh, system, you cannot preach the gospel. You understand? So they had to come. They didn't receive the word because Paul's altered his course. It was an epiphany that changed the course of history. But this story is about wise people. I don't want to use the generic word wise men because I think that women are wise and men are wise. And throughout the Bible you have very wise people in the Bible that, you know, that were both men and women. For example, Noah was a wise man. The Bible described him as a wise man because when God warned him about an impending flood, even though it was inconceivable to believe that it was going to rain, the Bible said he believed when others refused to believe. And he and his family and the animals were saved while the others perished. He was wise. The Bible described David as a wise man. He had a heart for God. He was, he was wise enough to say, the Lord is my shepherd. <coughs> Mary was a wise woman. The Bible says anytime Jesus went to Bethany, to the home of Mary and Martha, Mary would choose to sit, sit at the feet of Jesus Christ and listen to his words. The, words. the Bible also describes Solomon as a wise man. He was actually described as the wisest man that ever lived in his day. This is the man who was like 17 years old. He became the king. And God gave him an opportunity to ask anything that he would like in the world. And this 17 year old said, well, I don't want anything. I just need wisdom to be able to govern my people in the right way. And God said to him, because you've not asked for anything, you've not asked for wealth and for riches, I'm going to bless you with wisdom and I'm going to bless you with riches. And, and he was a richest man ever lived. Wisest man I ever lived. Actually, when you read further, in the, in the, in, in, when he was with God, then he was wise. But when he deviated, then he 
wonder whether he was wise or not, you know. If a man has how many wives? How many wives did Solomon have? 300. And how many concubines? 700. So this one man, he has 300 wives. Even me, one, I'm struggling with it. <laughs> how can you have 300? <laughs> hey. Are you, I, I feel playful with the animals. 300. On top of that, he had 700 concubines. This is like, how do you call concubines here? <laughs> eh? Girlfriends, yeah, girlfriends. <laughs> Maybe, well, that terms, you know, we have different terms. Sometimes I'm thinking in my local diet, how we call girlfriends, you know. <laughs> or, you know, somebody, you know, in our country too, in Ghana, you can have a wife and have, you know, we call them alele, alele, so, <laughs> alele women, you know, the, the people who tag along, you know, they are not, the, they are like the mistress, you know. No, they are not the mistress. They, <laughs> You see what happens to me when I go off tangent? <laughs> they are not the mistress, but they are the what? How do people call them? Girlfriends. Let me leave it at that. <laughs> but you know, you have wise people. Then we come to the story of the wise men. They call them the Magi. Now, why were they described as wise people? Now, these men were sophisticated in wisdom and in knowledge. They were knowledgeable in philosophy, in astrology, in medicine, in religion, in science. And the Bible said they were observing, they had contemplated that a Messiah was going to be born. You know, the death of a Messiah had been announced to the people of Israel for a long time. They thought the Messiah would come like Alexander the Great. You know, I mean, you know the story of Alexander the Great? He was like a mighty warrior and a conqueror. Nobody could stand. Uh, with him in war. He was very tough. And so the Israelites thought that the Messiah was going to come as a political uh, warrior. He was going to come like Alexander the Great or somebody who was tough and who could lead him to military battles. But he came as a baby. And this uh, Magi's, they had sought. They had to travel long distances, travel many miles, across deserts, oceans, and places to seek the king. Now listen to this. You know, around Christmas, when you look at the signs that people have in front of their churches, there's a sign that says, wise men still seek him. Now, do we still have wise men in this world today? I can tell that you people are wise because you've already um, fulfilled the criteria for people who are wise. Because wise people seek God. Wise people are the ones who seek God. They're the ones who come a long way to seek Him and to find Him. And the Bible says that when they, their only desire was to find this king who was born, to worship Him, they told Herod, we, where? we have come to seek the king that is to be born, so we we'll worship Him. You see, it, when, when we're thinking about wise people, we may think they are the politicians or people who are wealthy, or people who are, you know, in the, in the academia or anything. No, no, no. Wise people are those who forsake everything and simply come and worship God. They are wise. Like the, the wise man did. They came and worshiped. And the other thing they did, they said when they had come, you know, legend has it that there were three, there were three wise men. And that's legend. It's not in the Bible. So, you know, sometimes people read into the Bible. And one's name was Melchior. He was an older man. He was gray hair with a long beard. And he brought gold. And there's a second man. His name was Caspar. He was a young, ruddy man with no beard. He brought frankincense. And the third one, his name was Balthazar. And he was a black man. He was dark complexion. And he brought murder. You know, people came from the Mesopotamia area and they came. They didn't come empty handed. They opened their bags and they gave the Christ child gifts. Listen to this. 
Never come to God without a gift. You know, sometimes when you come to God, it's all right if you don't have anything. But you should always come with your widow's mind. You should always come with the little that you have. You should always come with your gold or your frankincense or your merit to worship the king. You see, the wise use their gifts to worship God. Because, you see, God is the source and is the foundation of everything. The Bible says he gives us the ability, the power to make wealth. The Bible says the silver and the gold belongs to God. The cattle on a thousand hills belongs to him. But he gives it to all of us so we can enjoy the benefits. So when we come to God, we should always demonstrate our dependability, our reliability with our gifts. Bring him our gold. Only the wise, you know, the people who think they are wise, they hold on to their gifts. But they are foolish. The Bible says there's a one who holds them, who holds them. I don't know how you use that word, holds. You know the word hold? You hold the things, you know, you stack up. And you think you are wise. No, no. And they say there's a one that scattered, gives, liberally, and that person is blessed more. In the scheme of things, the world will say, hold on to what you have. But if you are wise, especially when it comes to God, you give to God. Because there's a record of all your gifts to God. You see, when a story is told in heaven, whatever you give will be recorded and will be, will, will be appreciated. See, now that we talk about the wise or the magi, we always remember that they brought gold, they brought frankincense, they brought milk. Finally, the Bible says they were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod because their lives was in danger and they went on a different route. You see, the wise still listen to God. They still listen to his direction. They still listen to the word of God. They still follow and walk in obedience. You see, the Bible says that the... I mean, I want to quote from the Bible, but it said the stiff-necked, the, the, you know what is a stiff-necked person? Somebody who is um, stubborn, you understand? Like, God is saying something, but they will be stubborn, so they are not going to fall. They are going to be destroyed. The foolish are going to be destroyed. And the wise pays attention to God. The Bible says, trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. This year, God will direct your paths. He will warn you when there is danger. He will, he will, he will prompt you when, when you have to make a bad choice or a bad decision. You have to just listen. He's going to be by your side. His, his star and his life is going to lead you throughout the year. If you're just going to follow in obedience. This year, four things you have to do from this story of Epiphany. God is going to reveal things to you. God is going to open your eyes to see and to hear and to understand. But all that you have to do is to seek Him, is to worship Him, is to, is to serve Him with your gifts, and is to listen to Him. And when you do that, God is going to bless you. You're going to, be, you're going to enjoy the best of 2012. Your best days are in front of you, whether you believe it or not. There's hope for your future. God is still going to reveal things to you. God is going to show you new things. What's in your mind this year? What are your expectations this year? Let the light of Christ shine in your heart like the wise men and women found. And as you found that light, every darkness will be dispelled. And God is going to lead you. You see, let me finish this one, one thought. This thought just entered my mind. You see, he said, he warned them safely to their various countries, to their own country, right? Do you know that God promises to lead us safely to our heavenly home when we follow him? If you stay on the path, the same way he warned the, the Magi to go on a different route, God will, will, will continue to warn you so that eventually you end up in that heavenly home. You end up to work at where God wants you to be. This year, wherever God wants you to be, if you follow and you listen, you're going to get there. You're going to reach that potential. You're going to accomplish that. That what God has in store for you. You're going to receive the grace that God has in store for you. And you just have to listen and follow. Pay attention. 
Little, the still small voice is going to speak. Your heart is going to throb. You know, your mind is going to contemplate. So many things are going to, they are all going to be cues of epiphanies, revelations. God is going to, still going to bring inspiration into your lives. How many are ready for inspiration for 2012? Amen. Amen. This is going to be a great year for you to start right and you started right by being wise to start with God. These are our deadly things. Ask God to lead you through this year as the star guided the Magi, pray that the star of Christ, the light of Christ will lead you through this year. That God will, will just make you rest in his light. Just pray for a moment and ask God for all the things that you want